guys, uh, today we're going to get back into uh, our, our study through the book of John, and uh, I'm excited to do that. But um, again, it's been uh, an interesting week, and uh, life has continued to be disrupted for all of us. Um, there's an unusual uh, and really universal threat that we're all facing right now. And, and some of you are on the front lines of this thing, um, but others of us are beginning to feel it creep closer and closer. And so our experience has been varied over uh, these weeks and days. Uh, but I think it's pretty clear that, that this, is, this thing's going to get um, more personal and, uh, and a little more prevalent before it gets better. And so we keep looking to Jesus, um, and, and we know that he's with us in the midst of it. Um, but even with all of that, we know that it's taking a, a mental, a, a emotional, a, a physical toll on us. Um, and it's draining in many ways for all different reasons. Um, and it's just something that we're walking through right now. Um, and so certainly we're grateful for um, the downtime. Uh, we've had more time with our families. We've been outside more. Uh, maybe even engaging with our literal neighbors more, even though it's from a distance. More people seem to be outside. And so we praise God for those things. Maybe you've finally gotten to clean out that closet you've been putting off for years. Um, and so we've, we've seen benefits and we've seen the blessing of the Lord in it, more time with our families and meals together. Um, but certainly it's still taxing. And so the anxiety that many of us are, are wrestling with and the fears, the questions and the pressures of living in this new normal during this season uh, are certainly weighing on us. So I want to just start our time acknowledging that. And I know all of us are wired differently. We're different personalities uh, we've been through different things in our lives. Our, our context is a little different. Some of us are business owners. Some of us work uh, an hourly job. And so it's impacting us in different ways, but we're all uh, feeling the impacts of this thing. And so you're not alone. Uh, we're in this and the Lord is with us. And so two weeks ago, uh, we talked about some of those anchors that the Lord gives us to hold on to. Uh, with whatever storms we're facing. And we talked about how Jesus is our light and our life uh, and how he has provided us eternal life. And that eternal reality uh, is what anchors us in the present. And so we know that, that physical death is just a transition into eternal life and life as God intended it uh, for us to be with him. Um, but he's here with us now. And then last week we talked about the fact that Jesus is our good shepherd. And as our shepherd, uh, he guides us and he provides for us and he protects us, even to the point where he laid down his own life for us. He gave up his life so that we could have life in him. And so that is the character and nature of the God that we serve, the God who gave his life to pull us out of our sin and death. And so today we're going to jump into John 11. And I've been so encouraged that the Lord has been speaking to us each week I think right where we need to hear it as we go through these times. And today, I think you're going to find that uh, just as true and be just as encouraged. Um, so today, we're going to talk about all of the questions that, that you and I are having right now and, and people around the world are having right now, like, why is this happening? Where is God in the midst of this? Why doesn't it seem like he's here? Why doesn't it seem like he cares? Why are so many people suffering and, and dying uh, why, why isn't he doing anything about this? And so we're going to see that these aren't new questions. These are questions that humanity has asked for centuries and for millennia. And the Lord wants to meet us in those questions. Um, and so if you have your Bibles, please go ahead and turn to John chapter 11 with me. And as you're turning there, um, just a piece of context, uh, especially if you're just joining us in the middle of our John series that at this point in the story, uh, Jesus is no longer going into Jerusalem or even the surrounding area of Judea because the religious leaders are so angry with him. Uh, they're already plotting to kill him. They're trying to ensnare him and entrap him. And so Jesus is just staying away. He's in another region, um, not going near Jerusalem. Um, but the Gospels tell us that Jesus has some really good friends, three siblings, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, who live just outside Jerusalem in a little town called Bethany. And the scripture tells us that they're actually two miles outside of Bethany. 
So probably a couple hour walk. Um, and so Jesus hasn't seen those friends in a while because he's been staying away from the region. But apparently Lazarus has gotten really ill. So one of Jesus' good friends whom he loves dearly has gotten deathly ill. And that's where we pick up the story today. So John chapter 11, we're going to jump right in at verse 3. It says this. It says, so the sisters, this is Mary and Martha, sent to Jesus saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And so right away, Jesus is saying, it's almost like he's well aware, which we know he is, of the situation. And he's saying that the reason for this uh, is God has a purpose in this to glorify himself and me. That for whatever reason this is happening, why, the reason Lazarus is sick, I, I'm telling you, this doesn't end in death. That there's an ultimate thing here that's for the Lord's purposes. It's for the glory of God. You've heard me talk about the glory of God before as one definition is the display of God's perfections. All the things about him that are holy and pure, that's every part of him. His character, his nature, his deeds, his acts, his justice, his love, his righteousness, his mercy. All of those things are to the nth degree. He's perfect in everything he does. And so Jesus is saying, Lazarus's illness is another opportunity for the d display of the perfections of God to be seen. And what's really interesting is uh, in John chapter 9, two chapters before, um, when Jesus heals the blind man, this was a man born, born blind. And so the Jews come to Jesus one day and say, hey, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his sin or because of the sin of his parents? Because the belief at that time was like, if you suffered or you had suffering, it was directly because God is specifically punishing you for your sin. And in John chapter 9, Jesus responds to them and says, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So he gives them the same answer, like this guy's suffering isn't directly related to his sin. It's it, This was allowed to happen. He was he, The Lord allowed this man to be born blind so that the display of God's perfection might be known. And so Jesus is giving them the same answer here. Like, this isn't going to end in death. Uh, it's an opportunity for the glory of God to be seen. And, and, and brothers and sisters, that's the reason that God does or allows anything that he does. Ultimately, it's for the display of his perfections in the earth. And for those of us that belong to him, he promises throughout the scripture that he uses those things, even the hard broken sinfulness of our world. He uses those things and allows those things in our lives to make us more like him. And in the end, it is for our good, whether we can see it or realize it in the moment or not. And so look at verse five. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now I'm thinking, time out, wait a minute. The verse just told us how much he loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And then he says, so he decided to stay two more days instead of going right away and saying, hey, I'm going to go pray for Lazarus. Or oh, I'm going to go uh, be with Lazarus and heal him. He stays where he is. And I'm thinking, why? Why wouldn't he go immediately? It seems contradictory, right? If you loved him so much, why does he not respond to the request for him to come? Why didn't he rush to get there? Well, look at verse 7. It says, Then after this, Jesus said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. So he waits two extra days, and he says, All right, let's go. Now skip down to verse 17. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now this is interesting. So if you kind of break down the timing a little bit, then most likely Lazarus had died the day that the messenger came to Jesus. While the guy was en route to, to talk to Jesus, Lazarus most likely had died. And some scholars and many people that I read around this passage believe that Jesus waited those two extra days because at the time, many Jews had this superstitious belief that when someone died, their spirit hovered around the body just in case they were resuscitated and they would come back to life. But they all believed, according to the superstition, that on day four, the spirit departed, it was done, it was over, decay would start setting into the body physically. And so many people believe that Jesus delayed on purpose just to show, once again, his power over all of creation 
that only God could perform the miracle he's about to perform, leaving no doubt. And so he waits the four days. It's been four days. Verse 18, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now I'm thinking, I would have been thinking and asking the same thing, saying the same thing to Jesus, like, where were you? Like, we are basically, fan, like, we are very close. Uh, we love you. You know you love us. We've seen you do all these miracles. Like, where were you? Why didn't you come? If you would have come, he would not have died. But look at her faith in verse 22. She says, but even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And so even though he's died and been dead four days, Martha still has this thing, this faith in her that says, but Jesus, I know you still got it somehow. I know that whatever you ask of your father, he'll do. And look at how they go back and forth. Look at how Jesus engages with her. Jesus in verse 23 said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Yeah, like at the end of time and the, and the judgment day and all of that, everybody's going to rise and stand before God. Like, I know he's going to rise again. When Jesus was actually saying like, no, he, he's going to, I'm going to bring him back to life now. She doesn't know that yet though. She doesn't get it. Jesus said to her, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? In verse 27, Martha said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Now, one verse, she calls him Lord. She calls him Christ, which means Messiah. And she calls him the Son of God. So she believes that Jesus is who he says he is. But when she says in this text, I believe, it's in the perfect tense in the Greek, which means literally, um, I have believed and I will continue to believe. So in that sense, the, John's getting across here like Martha believed, but she still had questions. She still didn't get it. She's still wondering, Jesus, why didn't you come sooner? Can any of you relate to that in your own life? Can, can any of you relate to that with what we're facing now with the coronavirus? Like, Jesus, what are you doing? Why aren't you here? Why aren't you doing more? What's going to happen? Verse 28. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and calling for you. So skip down to 32. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. Now, what's very interesting from another story with Mary and Martha, we know that these two sisters were very different, as I'm sure some of you are very different from your siblings. Martha was more the task-to-do list person, uh, wasn't ever sitting down. She always had to get stuff done. She was the first in this story to run out to Jesus and, and cut to the chase, where Mary was the much more uh, pondering, thoughtful. And the three times that we see this Mary mentioned in Scripture, all three times she is at the feet of Jesus. And so very different women. But look at what Mary says when she comes to Jesus. She fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She has the same exact comment for Jesus that her sister Martha has. Like, Jesus, what gives? Why didn't you come? You could, could have prevented this whole thing from happening. Now, I know that these sisters, I'm sure they had heard the story of how Jesus and John 4 had, had healed the uh, official son. Remember the messenger had come, or this man had come to Jesus and said, my son is really sick. And Jesus just spoke the word from long distance. The son wasn't anywhere nearby and the boy was healed. And so I'm sure they're thinking like, Jesus, you could have done something at least, but instead our brother has died. Why, Jesus? Why didn't you do anything? It's too late now. Look at 33. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. 
So you have these two things. He's deeply moved and greatly troubled. So there's this deep emotion. He's deeply moved in his spirit, like it's guttural. He's feeling the anguish and gravity as he's viewing other people weeping uh, at, at the loss. Uh, he's feeling that in himself. And so he's mourning that with them. But then he says, greatly troubled. Greatly troubled, literally translated there, is irate or angry. And sometimes it's hard for us to picture Jesus as angry or irate because we often know that our anger is a sinful anger, but there is righteous anger. And so what I believe uh, Jesus is angry at right now, I don't think he's angry that these two sisters have said, where were you? Why weren't you here? You could have done something. Because the way he's already interacted with Martha and the way we're going to see him interact with them uh, in a few verses, I don't believe he's angry at them. I personally believe that Jesus is angry at the effects of sin and death. Jesus walked the earth. He became personal and local to us. He had emotions like we have emotions. These were his friends that he cared about. And death itself and Satan are the enemy of Jesus. He came to defeat the power of sin and death. And so now in this moment, he is face to face with the effects of sin and death uh, with someone that he deeply loved. I think that stirred the anger within him. I know many of you uh, that are, are listening, you have faced uh, the effects of sin and death with someone in your family suffering and dying, whether it be from cancer or suffering over a long period of time with something else. You have seen the effects of sin ravage somebody. And, and I think you would agree that there is this deep, guttural anger at sin and death that comes out of us when we see that happen. It's the same thing when we see the abortion that is taking place in our country and around the world, that there is something that is not right. It is not just. It is evil. When we see child abuse or different things, it is right for us to be angry at the sin and death that we see around us. And Jesus is moved deeply by those same things. He has a guttural reaction. He is the author of life. He is the sustainer of life. He's the giver of life. Uh, he is life itself. And when he comes up against death, he has a reaction as he should. It's another display of his perfections that he is perfectly just and perfectly angry at the things that he should be angry at. And so look at what happens in verse 35. They said to him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35 is the shortest verse in all of scripture. It simply says, Jesus wept. I mean, think of what it looks like to weep. Jesus, the Son of God, the all-powerful creator of the universe, wept. And so the Jews said, see how he loved him. They're acknowledging like, man, he loved Lazarus. But some of the others uh, said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? So the, the bystanders have the same reaction. They, they understand that Jesus loved him. And they're like, couldn't he have done something? We've seen him do all these other miracles. Why didn't he do something? Then Jesus, verse 38, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. When Jesus got word four days before that Lazarus was deathly ill, um, do you think he knew that Lazarus was going to die? And most likely, do you think he knew that Lazarus had already died by the time he got the message? I think we would probably all agree, yes, like Jesus knew. Um, verse 4 told us that he had a plan. He knew that, that this was allowed to happen. This was happening so that God would be glorified. So do you think Jesus knew then what he was eventually going to do that we're going to read in the next couple of verses? I think we would all agree, yes, he knew what he was going to do. So that tells me that Jesus is not crying because he's hopeless. He's not crying because he feels like he blew it or he missed his window of opportunity to do something for Lazarus and the family. Um, and then consider this, consider what Jesus didn't do or what Jesus didn't say as he walks on the scene that day and people are weeping and, and, and groaning. Uh, Jesus doesn't come on the scene knowing fully what he's going to do in just a moment. He doesn't come in and say, uh, what is wrong with you guys? Like, what are you crying about? Do you realize uh, who I am? 
He doesn't say, uh, this isn't a big deal. Everybody just chill out. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to bring him back to life. Just wait a second. He doesn't come in and scold them saying, where is your faith, guys? Come on, you've seen me do lots of miracles. Don't you think I can do something about this too? He doesn't say, how many times do I have to prove it to you? You should get it by now. Um, Jesus doesn't do that at all. And he doesn't say, any of that. Instead, he joins them in their grief. Four times it told us he was deeply moved, deeply grieved and troubled. He wept and he was deeply moved again. Jesus entered into the grief that others were experiencing. Isaiah 53 tells us that Jesus was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He understands the pain and the loss that we feel. He is with us in it. He entered into our broken world when he didn't have to. He chose to move toward us. He became local to us uh, to share in our grief and our pain. He subjected himself to all of it when he didn't have to. He could have showed up that day and been like, hey, let's get to it. Don't worry about it. Hey, hey, suck it up. Stop crying. It's all going to be fine. But he didn't do that. And so I think the same is true for each. I know the same is true for each of us today as we are facing all different emotions over these days and weeks, all different emotions and thoughts and doubts and fears and anxieties and questions. Uh, Jesus is with us in it. And he's not looking at us with his arms crossed and just shaking his head and rolling his eyes like, man, I wish these people would get it together. I thought they believed in me. I thought they had faith. Uh, he's not doing any of that. I think the heart of Jesus is broken for what he has seen our broken world doing to people right now with the suffering and the death. Jesus is with us in it. He gets it. He's not scolding us for the, all the different emotions that you and I are wrestling with. Just like Martha, rock solid faith in that sense. Like she believed that Jesus was the son of God, but she still had questions. She still had uh, hurt. Like, where were you, Jesus? Uh, this week in our restore group that some of you are in, um, there was one line in the workbook that really uh, stood out to me that Robert Chung wrote. It says this, it says, since all things were made through Jesus and for Jesus, it's possible for everything to be remade through him as well. And so watch what Jesus does in 39. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Like, just hold on a second, watch this. So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. Remember, that's a theme throughout John. He's writing these things, recording things, so that we would believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That's why it's included. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Can you see that visual <laughs> that he speaks into this dark tomb, this dark cave, and he, Lazarus, come out, and all of a sudden, this, I mean, literally a mummy comes out. He's still wrapped. Even his face is wrapped, comes out from the tomb, and Jesus says, unbind him and let him go. There's a song on Christian radio that came out many years ago, but there's a line in that song I've always loved. The chorus goes, uh, speaking of the Lord, you're the one who conquers giants. You're the one who calls out kings. You shut the mouths of lions and you tell the dead to breathe. Jesus tells the dead to breathe. Jesus is the only one who has power over death. And he brought Lazarus back. Some have said that maybe one reason Jesus wept and was crying was because we know that the Bible teaches that when we physically die, we are with the Lord. Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so Lazarus was with the Lord for four days um, that he was dead. 
And so some have speculated that maybe some of the grief Jesus was feeling wasn't just identifying the loss that Lazarus's family was feeling, but maybe he was also identifying with the loss that Lazarus was feeling late. Jesus knew he was going to pull Lazarus back from being with the Lord back to earth. And that in some ways, well, ultimately, that's a loss for Lazarus. And Jesus alone knew what it was like to give up the glories of heaven, to come to the earth, to enter into the brokenness of humanity. And so on this side of heaven, it's like, man, this is an amazing miracle. It shows the power of God and Jesus over death. Absolutely. And it's a foreshadowing that in a few months, Jesus is going to rise from the dead and out of the tomb himself. But at the same time, Lazarus is coming back. He's also going to die again. Lazarus will face a physical death again at some point and re-enter into the life that's been given for us for all eternity. And so physical death isn't the end. And we can be so focused on this is it, this is life. And Jesus is like, I'm Lord over it all. I have something so much bigger for you. One pastor I read this week said this. He said, God's love for his own is not a pampering love. It is a perfecting love. We must never think that suffering and love are incompatible. And so it just makes me think as um, sometimes the terms like helicopter parenting, where these parents that want to do everything they can to insulate and protect their kids so they experience no hardship, no struggle, even when they go off to college and try to look for their first job, the parents are calling and trying to set everything up for their kids. But we know that that's not doing their kid any favor, that through suffering, through mistakes, uh, we learn and we grow as people, and it's actually loving for us as parents to let our children experience a certain amount of suffering. Some medical procedures are incredibly painful, but in order to save life, it has to happen. And so if we can see uh, the Lord's perspective on our lives in that same way, that he is our infinite father who sees everything from eternity to eternity, he loves us more than anybody loves us, and he promises that... Uh, Whatever he allows to happen in our lives, no matter how painful the suffering is, he's with us in it and he's using it for his glory and for our good. We just can't see it at times. And so maybe like me, you can look back on your life and be like, man, I went through some stuff, but already I can see the Lord at work in it. And already in some of those things, I can already say, Lord, thank you for allowing that suffering because I've seen what you've used it to do in my own heart, that I love you more, I'm more like you. But maybe you're like me, you can also look back at your life and see some things that the Lord walked you through, and you're just like, I still don't get it. Lord, where were you? Why did you let that happen? I look back on um, Devin's first pregnancy, uh, our first child we lost to a miscarriage, and I don't have answers for that. I know that the Lord was with us. I can see that he's used our story to encourage some other people. But I don't have that figured out yet. I don't have this big answer of, Lord, why did you allow that? And so I know that many of you have those same questions, those same things. But Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, the Lord says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. That he sees the big picture, and we need to rest in that, knowing that he loves us. Because Psalm 34, I want to share a few quick verses as we wrap up. Psalm 34, 18 tells us, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Isaiah 42, 3 says, A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Psalm 103, 13 through 14 says, As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. And I think that's exactly what we see in this passage of Jesus being so tender and patient and loving with Mary and Martha. That they come to him, they're like, Lord, we, we believe in you, but we've got questions. And the Lord is slow to anger and compassionate. He knows our frame, he remembers that we're dust. He's patient with us. So wherever your heart and mind are today, this morning, uh, I'm sure many of you have had an absolutely exhausting week. I'm sure you have all these different frustrations and concerns about the future. Some of you are already facing very hard decisions at work that you've had to make this week. Some of you are facing illness yourself, illness with friends and family and colleagues. You see the thing creeping closer, as I said earlier. Um, 
The Lord is patient with you. Take your questions, your anxieties, your fears, all of us. He invites us because of his great love for us. He says, cast your cares, your anxieties on me because I care for you. That is the heart of our Father. That's the heart of our Lord who laid his life down for us. He says, bring it to me. I want to be with you in it. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this reminder this week for my own heart, Lord, as as uh, things are getting more real and more prevalent day to day now. Um, Jesus, we need these things to hold on to. I thank you, Lord, that we got this window into your heart and your love and your care for us, that you mourn with those who mourn, Lord. You weep with those who weep. And so, Lord, for everybody this morning, um, that is feeling the weight of those things. I pray that they would feel no condemnation for their doubts, for their questions, Lord, but they would sense uh, you just wrapping your arms around them tighter. For those, Lord, who are exhausted, I pray that you would give them the energy of your spirit. For those, Lord, who are anxious, I pray that you would give them your peace, that your hand would hold them down and hold them up. Lord, for those that need wisdom and have really hard decisions to make, some who have life and death decisions to make, Jesus, I pray, God, that you would be uh, the wisdom that they need in the moment, that they would be able to rest in that. Lord, I thank you for your care for us. I thank you for your love for us. I thank you, Lord, that you are taking the pain and brokenness and effects of sin in the world, that you are using them somehow for your purposes. Even though we don't see it in the moment, Lord, we can rest in the fact that you promise that you are, that you have been faithful to us, and you will continue to be faithful to us. Lord, help us to keep our eyes on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, we love you. We are praying for you. We are in this together. Thank you for your love and your prayers, for standing with each other, for serving each other, for serving your neighbors. If there's something specific we can be praying for you, please let us know. If there's a specific need you have, whatever it is, financial, whatever, please let us know. Our sharing fund is up and running. Several people have given to that. So if you have a financial need, please contact me. Um, the Lord wants us to bear each other's burdens in that way. And so as we wrap up today, I want to share 2 Thessalonians 3.16 as the benediction. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you his peace at all times and in every situation. The Lord be with you all. We love you.